Hi, so thanks for having me. Today I'd like to talk to you about our most recent work in trying to understand the way viruses evolve and hopefully come up with ways to fight them through antiretroviral therapies. Um, and we're going to do all of this through large-scale coarse-grained simulations. And I'll explain what that means in a few slides. OK. So as my title suggests, we're interested in viruses. And obviously, the biomedical impact of what we're trying to do is we're trying to find new therapies to really kill or you know, prevent them from spreading infection. But there's also a really important and I think really interesting fundamental aspect of this. So viruses, you can think of them as the quintessential example of a macromolecular complex. And what I mean by that is nature has somehow found a way to take many, many copies of a protein and assemble them non-conveniently to form these very large complexes that then have important macroscopic functionality for the way the virus does what it does. Okay. So for example, these little green things here, they float up and assemble into some lattice. And then you eventually form this particle that becomes infectious, and then it does its thing. And we want to prevent that from happening. Now, because this is a macromolecular uh, complex, one important thing to realize is that if we want to understand this macroscopic behavior, we really have to dive into what's happening at the molecular scale, the macromolecular scale. And so in order to do that, there are many approaches. I'm going to describe three general ways. The first way is using something called electron microscopy. And here, this is structural biologists. They look at electron density. And they get these really high resolution sub-nanometer images um, where they can map out atomic resolution positions and structure. But one of the limitations is that we're really only getting ensemble average, a static picture of what these proteins are doing. Another complementary technique is known as fluorescence microscopy. So this could be things like STORM or SPT POM. And this is a little bit different. Now we use these fluorescent tags to try to track on the single particle level what these proteins are doing. And so we get this dynamic picture, which is really nice. But now the limitation is that the resolution we get, I think, is about 10 to 20 nanometers at best. So we're not quite at the level we want to go. And so the approach we're going to use today is um, computer simulations, primarily molecular dynamics. And this gives us both molecular resolution information as well as that dynamic information that we want. Of course, you know, models don't mean anything unless we have some sort of validation or uh, predictive power. So in reality, if we want to approach this problem, we're going to need all three of these. And so this is our goal. OK, so you've probably all seen some variant of this plot, but I'm going to show you my spin on it. Um, the reason we can't just do conventional molecular dynamics is that if we look at the time scales and length scales that are required, especially for viruses, we just can't reach them. So viruses, they require thousands and thousands of copies of proteins. So that's a huge number of atoms in our system. We have solvent. We have all these other constituents. It's just really hard. And the actual dynamics require something on the order of hours for these proteins to do what they need to do. So conventional molecular simulations are somewhere around here. Um, and the main thing we do is we parallelize them in terms of the spatial domain. So we use spatial decomposition. We say, you, this node deals with these particles, and so on and so forth. What we can't parallelize is time. Right? Time is uh, sequential. We can only go as far as, uh, or as low as the highest fluctuations in our system. And so that's our bottleneck. There are some specialized HPC systems, such as the Anton computers that can actually push this envelope further by making this really efficient. So we can go to much higher timescales. Okay. Another approach is to use something called enhanced sampling techniques. So we can use conventional molecular dynamics. But what we're doing here is we're, there are many different ways of doing this. But we're, what we're trying to do is uh, sample rare events that we wouldn't typically see in a simulation. So let's say we just run a conventional MD simulation, and we see our event once in a, in a typical trajectory. With these kind of enhanced sampling techniques, we may see it 100 times or 1,000 times in that same time frame. And hopefully, we can get statistically meaningful results that way. But of course, what you can see is that there's still a large gap between this space and this space. And so our approach to try to bridge that gap is to use something called coarse grain simulations. The, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the basic idea is that we take some atomic resolution system, so this is I think this is like a polypeptide in water. And there are two steps we take. 
The first is to map the system. And what that means is we're going to take this and we're going to create some reduced representation of the atomic degrees of freedom in our system. So in this case, we're going to get rid of water. Um, and all we're going to care about is a protein. And we're going to map several of these um, protein uh, atomic degrees of freedom to effective coarse grain sites, which are these light green beads here. And so that already saves a lot of the computational costs from these models. The next step then is to, uh, once we have this mapping, is to find out what are the effective interactions. So because we use this particle-based simulation approach, we need to understand what, how these particles interact with each other so we can evolve positions and momentum over time. And in our group, what we try to do is figure out systematic ways of doing this. Right? Um, these are so-called bottom-up models or uh, physics-based approaches. One other nuance that I want to point out is that we're trying to promote this new general framework or methodology known as ultra coarse screening. And the idea here is that when we have a protein and we want to represent it with very few sites, let's say 10 to 20 atoms, that's you know, many, many residues mapped to one site. It's impossible to think that simple uh, you know, classical two-body interactions is going to represent anything meaningful about that protein. And so what we try to do is increase the expressivity of our coarse grain models using something called internal states. And these internal states can describe a lot of different things, such as structural transitions within degrees of freedom within the bead. They could do things like um, chemical transitions, such as ATP or ADB bound uh, moieties, or you might have protonation changes, things like that. And what we come up with are systematic ways of dealing with this state switching. OK. So all of that is to say that we have this methodology. Now, the reason we use blue waters is that the use of these coarse grain models actually introduce some other technical challenges that most conventional MD simulations don't have to deal with. And the big part of it is that since we're using these implicit solvent coarse grain models, all of a sudden we have a very sparse heterogeneous system. And so we have, I'm going to um, talk about this code very briefly. This is actually the baby of one of my uh, previous coworkers, John Grime, and he's presented on this code before. So I'm going to go through this rather quickly. But the first aspect is that we have a um, very hard load balancing problem because of the heterogeneity. And so what we actually do is we take 3D space and we split it up onto a one-dimensional manifold using Hilbert space filling curves. And we use that to um, do our load balancing. The other aspect is that because we have this very sparse system, memory requirements can scale very dramatically when we have these huge systems such as in a cell. Right? Uh, all that extra space is unnecessary when we, look at, when we think about typical cell lists for Verlet lists and things like that. And so we use a dynamic cell map to actually dramatically reduce those memory requirements. And the last thing is that um, if you think about the way information is stored in these simulations, uh, for example, if you have many, many copies of the same thing, you have to have some, uh, some storing of the topologies and the atom definitions and everything for each of those molecules. But of course, when you have these really large systems, that is also a huge memory requirement. And so what we do is we use templating to say, during runtime, we're going to dynamically uh, assign topologies and atom definitions and all that stuff during the simulation. And what this additionally allows us to do then is we can actually switch between molecular templates uh, during runtime. So we can uh, use this as a way to do efficient state switching. Okay, so I'm going to use everything I just described to talk about what we studied um, for this particular biophysical system, which is uh, HIV. And in HIV, there are two aspects that I want to point out. Really, we're looking at the late stages. So this is where you already have an infected cell. You have proteins that are generated from the viral DNA. And it produces many copies of the viral protein, the viral genome. And what it wants to do is package this new particle to spread infection to new cells. So this step here, this is actually the packaging of proteins with RNA and eventually forms this really beautiful lattice here where we have a lot of local hexameric order. But then in the large scale, you see a bunch of defects and it's incomplete. So there's some uh, pleomorphism in the structures of these immature lattices. And eventually, you get a bud and a particle to form. And this immature lattice undergoes proteolytic cleavage, where these proteins are cleaved. And then a subset of those proteins actually form this very nice conical core shown here, which hosts the viral RNA. And this is a protection mechanism that eventually this capsid then goes on and goes into the new cell. And that's where 
uh, it has to interact with the nucleus to inject this viral RNA. And so I'm really going to study or show you results for this process and this process, but eventually we'd like to do the whole thing. Okay. So I'm going to show you two movies. This is about the immature assembly of these polyproteins. The main thing you want to know is that if you look at this movie, this is a minimal construct of the protein indicated by the gray and the yellow things. And the red squiggly thing, that's the viral RNA. And when, I'm, when I play this movie, what I want you to look at is how these proteins start to aggregate and form into these ordered lattices. So here we go. The RNA uh, tethers of proteins. They start to assemble with each other. There is constant association dissociation. And eventually, we start to form this cluster with very nice hexameric order. So we have six proteins that form this uh, six-fold coordination. And eventually, this spreads into a, an overall hexameric lattice. And so what's important here is that what we've shown is that the RNA is an essential catalyst for uh, driving this process forward. Without RNA, at these concentrations, there's zero assembly. What we can also show is when we introduce uh, a, an additional domain, so this extra domain is on top of this gray thing. And this additional domain, what it does is it imparts extra curvature through strain into these uh, proteins when they ligamerize. And so now the actual membrane deformation plays an important role in uh, regulating the assembly process. So again, this is the movie. The only difference between this and this is now we have an extra blue domain. And this is a side view. So now you can see as the membrane deforms, it co-localizes the assembly of these proteins. You can see it's actually much slower than what's going on here because there are additional entropic barriers. But what it allows is a very well-formed and well-ordered lattice to form. We can use a similar technique then to study something, the mature capsid, which is that second step I talked about before. And very similar things are happening here. So this is just an example of how these various protein dimers interact. And they form this very important intermediate known as a trimer of dimers. So green is, that's one dimer. Blue is another dimer. And red is another dimer. So this is an intermediate. And these intermediates then template, like in this fashion, to form something called the hexameric unit. So at the end of the day, this mature core should look something like this. And what we know from the Euler characteristic is that in order to have an enclosed shape like this, you need 12 pentamers to be incorporated. Okay, so the color coding I'm going to use is red for the pentamers and green for the complete hexamers. So one thing that's interesting about this protein is that um, NMR studies have shown that there is actually a very diverse population of conformational states this protein can adopt. And only a subset of those uh, conformational states are actually assembly competent. And so we can build in that kind of uh, functionality into our models using this state switching thing I described before. So when we assume, so let's assume that these proteins are all assembly competent. We're not going to do any sort of state switching, and we're just going to let the simulation run. And in this case, you see very rapid assembly, but they form these um, misassembled, crazy jelly roll shape kind of things that don't really look like this. So that's not good. However, when we introduce this uh, state switching where we actually control the population of these assembly competent and intermediates, then what we start to see is that we have a very well-ordered and controlled self-correcting assembly, similar to what we saw in the immature lattice as well. And eventually, we'll start to form something like this. These simulations, we simulate them on the order of uh, 300 million time steps. So they take quite a long time, so we actually haven't gotten them to completion. But you can start, you can see, you know, if you were to do this long enough, it probably gets to something close to this. Okay. So based on those two studies, we can take some very general insights from this. If we think about what nature does, uh, they take advantage of the fact that these proteins have inherently weak interactions at these interfaces. But what we can do is we can augment those weak interactions through very specific protein-protein interfaces and through conformational changes. And if you have enough of those weak interactions, then you can start to get protein-protein association. So assuming you have some state where you have just enough interaction strength and just enough specificity, you start to get something like this, where from the disassembled state, you get assembly on some, this is a one-dimensional manifold that doesn't mean anything. But the whole point is that that wiggling shows that it's a self-correcting behavior that eventually gets a proper assembly. 
Now what this implies is that perhaps if we perturb this balance, we can introduce states that reduce infection, infectivity. So for example, we can increase protein-protein interaction strength and we get these aberrant dendritic-like formations and we get this, these defects here that form. And these should not be infectious because they actually prevent the proper assembly of the bud, which is what allows these particles to spread their infection. Similarly, we might introduce um, competitive inhi inhibitor, uh, inhibitors. So one of our collaborators, collaborators is really interested in um, non-silencing microRNA. And what we've shown is that with increased populations of this non-silencing RNA, we can actually uh, decrease the population of large clusters uh, compared to the wild type. So this is experimental results, and our simulation shows something similar. Now we can take these ideas, and we can go back to this capsid that I described before. I really want to introduce this drug known as the, um, it's the capsid inhibitor, first capsid inhibitor of its kind from uh, Gilead Sciences, and it's known as GSCA1. And what's really interesting about this is that it has, uh, it dramatically reduces infectivity at picomolar concentration. And the way it works is unclear, and so we're trying to probe those mechanisms using our simulations. But the putative mechanism we think is that these drugs, what they do is they actually overstabilize or supercharge the way these proteins interact with each other. So we can simulate something like that by taking those trimer of dimer-like constructs I showed you before, boosting the local population of those intermediate states. And what we can see is that from previous conditions where we got zero assembly in our UCG switching type models, by having a small population of these boosted intermediates, we start to see nucleation and growth. We can take this further, and uh, here we go. We can take this further, and we can actually take conditions that we looked at before, introduce some additional uh, intermediate populations of those trimer of dimers, and what we see is when we compare the canonical capsid structures to these new structures, these are drug loaded. We see a huge variety variety of morphology, uh, morphologies. Um, which actually correspond to some of the experimental population seen in cryo-ET studies, so that's quite promising. Now, the actual reason this it reduces infectivity, there are two potential pathways for that. One is that they're too small and too narrow to house the RNA, or they assemble too rapidly for the RNA to be incorporated. The other aspect is that if you look at these blue spots all over the capsid structure, you can see that these blue spots, they indicate defects. And th these defects may reduce the stability of these capsids, thereby rendering them uh, ineffective in terms of protecting the viral RNA. Okay, so if we go back to this picture, the basic idea is that um, let's say we were to find some way to reduce the energetics or increase the specificity. We might reduce the enthalpic driving force or increase the entropic barriers. And so that when these proteins try to self-assemble, they eventually go back to the disassembled state. On the other hand, through the strategies I just showed you, what we can try to do is increase the interaction strength or decrease specificity and perhaps drive the system towards some alternative off-kinetic pathway, which in our case would be some aberrant assembly state. And the hope is that these aberrant assembly states are non-infectious. Okay, so for the final 30 seconds, I'm gonna briefly talk about an idea we've been playing around with, and the idea is something called coarse grain directed simulation. And here, what we want to do is, assuming we have some you know, overall structure such as a capsid, we want to simulate just a subset of those um, atomic degrees of freedom while having it feel the overall environment. So this, for example, is a filament, and we want to represent the monomers in this little box as if it were in the environment of the filament. And we can do this using this, this technique which we published um, and the idea here is that in the simulations I showed before, instead of taking an all-atom simulation, which is a prodigious amount of work, 75 million atoms, we could probably only do one or two of these, because of the polymorphism of these structures, what we'd like to do instead is take various aspects of this capsid and in fact do an ensemble of trajectories where we look at different states such as this curvature point and this curvature point, and really dive deep, deep into the atomic details of what's happening here through this kind of coarse-grain directed simulation approach. 